Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first installment of the Imperial Age podcast. This is going to be a, uh, well, first it's going to start out as an experimental podcast of talking about various periods of history from the uh, Protestant Reformation to the First World War, so roughly 1517 to 1914. And we're going to be sort of discussing random history topics, really cool events, figures, uh, periods, and culture stuff, and all that sort of good stuff. And uh, today is, we're going to be discussing Tudor England from the end of the War of the Roses to the end of Queen Elizabeth I's reign. So 1483 or 85 to 1603. I am joined today by my friends Todd Lewis of the Pod Praise Folly podcast and Mauritian Struggle. So how's it going, lads? I'm doing all right. How are you doing, Fritz? Good, good. Yeah, it's um, going great. <clears throat> so to start off, to set the scene, the... War of the Roses between many of the, no the leading noble houses of England for the throne ended with the death of the flower of English nobility. It was a it had ravaged England's noble classes, and all that seemed to be left to take the throne was this very odd little pernicious Welsh family called the she called the Tedders or Tudors was only a term that was sort of used der derisively much much later. But you had Henry the Seventh. The Dutch and his Dutch army invade from France, I think, and take seize the throne of England. And his son, Henry VIII, the pompous but decisive little bastard he was, teenager, took the throne in, I think, what year was it? I think it's 1509. 1509. 1509. Uh, and that's sort of where we begin. England has receded from the world stage as a great power, uh, no longer a major European power. It's being overshadowed by the emerging great superpowers of France and Habsburg Spain under Charles V. And England's, England has become much more of a backwater and its quality of life and standard of living decreased. But Edward Henry seeks to change this. So I guess where should we begin? Any, uh, any interesting thoughts on what we think about Henry VIII? Well, actually, I wanted to add a few things about Henry the Seventh, real quick. Sure, um, sure, go ahead. So yeah, Henry the Seventh uh, ends the the feuding a after he wins the Battle of Bosworth to cement his alliance with the other Yorkists. In fact, he even gets support against he uh, Richard the Third. He had to promise to marry Elizabeth of York in order to say, "Look, you know, we're going to defeat Richard, but you Yorkists are still going to have a stake in the matter." But of course, there were still other claimants to the throne with with better claims than he did and so he still had to fight Yorkist uprisings up until the 15 the 1490s and much of his foreign policy was a trying to dissuade foreign backers from backing these people so the Holy Roman Empire the French and also fighting allies in fact his son who he named Arthur he had uh, he had originally arranged to marry Catherine of Aragon to cement an alliance with Spain but he died in childhood and of course, later on, Henry VIII would marry Catherine of Aragon. Mm -hmm. and, and also, he he also uh, was a great administrator that um, restored some of the finances of England after thirty years of civil war and desolation. Mm -hmm. Well, they, I think the interesting thing about the uh, end, the sort of end result of the War of the Roses, is the fact that for the it didn't really seem to ravage or didn't really actually seem to affect all that much the uh, the peasant or the the common population, but it was really only the noble class and it sort of it was so it, you know the sort of prestige and power of the nobility didn't even wasn't something that really came back until centuries later within the you know the, the 18th and 19th centuries when sort of the idea of the victorian gentleman came about because that was only because it was only by then that the noble that nobility had sort of reasserted itself because at this point you know i uh, so many heirs were lost and so many sort of family dynasties have been destroyed by the war of the roses hey um just a quick question i'm not sure you're live streaming because i can't find it well, it says live so yeah i'm just looking for the actual live streams ah there we go all right i'm just being a spaz that's fine that's fine <clears throat> what else should we talk about so yeah uh don't worry this is experimental so um Mauritian, you have anything to talk about the sort of early years of the Tudor reign? Well, I think what it's important to understand about Henry the Seventh is that he was probably the best monarch of the Tudor dynasty. 
in a lot of ways, people will think Elizabeth the first was the best, but I think that's because she was really good at placating the nobility, and she was very good at finding a sort of sen- uh, sort of she was very centrist. Yeah, yeah, like especially uh, you're talking about the religious policy, right? Well, not just that, but I'm talking about economic policy as well because mm-hmm. the thing is, is that the like super the the Tudor monarchs after that were really horrific with their financial policies. So, for instance, the Book of Rates wasn't reformed, which is um for those who don't know what the Book of Rates were, it was a book that basically stated what traders could trade their goods for. So it was a very controlled economy sort of thing, and this mm-hmm. wasn't reformed for upwards of i think about a hundred years because and so therefore people would trade their goods but they wouldn't be getting that much wealth in return so a lot of people were in a very bad economic position and it wasn't even reformed until james the first which we'll get into on the next episode i think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah and i think um sort of distributist uh, as a um, bit of advice he thinks a cool thing we should try and do is sort of uh, raise up these figures that have been a little more shrouded in mystery or who aren't as well known. So I think perhaps t- uh, talking more about Henry the Seventh is a good idea. So because I don't actually not know, know, know that much about him either. So if you guys could sort of enlighten us a little more on why you think uh, Mauritian, why do you think he was the better, the best uh, English, the best Tudor monarch outside because of? He, I'd say because he probably had the best grasp on administrative skill of any of the kings and queens of the Tudor dynasty. I'd say the only one who is second to that would be Mary the first, which we'll get onto a bit later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because we all know that Henry the Eighth really fucked the economy up badly. Edward the Fifth didn't really have an opportunity to do that. And Jane Seymour well. only re- ruled for nine days. <laughs> yeah, she basically lost a week. And <laughs> Hem- and Elizabeth was more focused on placating her own subjects. And, and the fact that she was facing a giant, you know, she was, yeah, that, and also f- the fact that she was facing a huge war, she couldn't really afford to be, uh, to focus more administratively because of the fact that, you know, the, Sp- have- the Spanish, the Spanish and French are breathing down their necks. Yeah, I, it did take like 27 years for it to reach that point though. Yes, yes. Although there was a lot of developments before that, which we'll obviously get into later in the stream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to shill this on 4chan. Don't shill it on... Oh, don't give us the link. Don't give the Hangout link or I'll kill you. No, oh, I'm not going to give them the Hangout <laughs> link, am I? I'm, gonna give them, I'm giving them the, um, the, the link so they can watch it. Like, oh, oh, um, are you going to go on Hiss then? Yeah, I'm on Hiss. Doing good, it good. So. The only good board on that entire that in the wallpapers, but but anyway, anyways, anyways. Um, wallpapers? No, no. Poll's pretty good, I think. All right, we're not going to talk about fortune. Um, <laughs> I I don't know how they got onto that, but uh, yeah, Todd, do you have anything to say about Henry the Seventh? The other than the fact that uh, he's he worked unlike a lot of other tutors and stewards, pretty closely with Parliament. Parliament and him got along much better than say parliament and james the first or charles the first um some of the laws he passed were streamlining administration um you know administrating crown lands over the royal estates that you know helped the uh you know the sheriffs collect taxes and raise the militia he streamlined the, the government and he also increase the revenues that he was getting. He was a f- shrewd financial uh, administrator as well. So he was able to get money in for the government that had, of course, been lost due to the war. And so, yeah, nothing in particular, just that he was a shrewd uh, politician and a very good administrator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Admittedly, though, that's because the nature of the parliament evolved over time. Because initially, after um, Magna Carta, which we're getting back here, but the purpose the way it was utilized in reality was more as a means of um getting things passed for the king mm-hmm. whereas at the end of elizabeth's reign as she got more and more weak that meant that she wasn't able to keep parliament in check so it sort of developed a mind of its own which obviously culminated in the civil war yeah yeah <sighs> all right <laughs> Yeah, I don't actually. I I didn't. I don't think I researched it enough on all this thoroughly because that's what you guys are for. Um, 
I'm just a pleb. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I know. Don't worry. I know a lot more about the Stuart period, but when we get, we can get to that next time. But um, uh, so should we move on to Henry the Eighth then? And sure. that fat bastard. That, that fat bastard who fucked everything up. Didn't adapt the right he, kind well, of. He, he fucked every. He fucked everybody up, including his own wives. <laughs> Well, he didn't. Act, I don't think he actually had. Uh, actually, I don't think he managed to. to did he have kids with with Anne of Cleves? Uh, no, he didn't. Yeah, he, he didn't because he because couldn't he get it. Up. He couldn't get he it up. Get it up. <laughs> he needed to. He he didn't have enough Viagra. She was too fucking ugly. <laughs> well, and he was also too fucking old. It was Rosie O'Donnell, pretty much like the German Rosie O'Donnell. So, so are you comparing Henry VIII to the president? Build the wall. <laughs> build the build the wall. Make France pay for it. That's right. That's right. Make my ex-wife pay for it. <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, Henry the Eighth. Um, I don't know where do we start. <laughs> we start at the start, I guess. Yeah. Uh, when he, he comes he, to power, he marries Catherine of Aragon to fulfill his father's vision of an alliance with Spain. He was originally married to his older brother, and he Arthur. died. He died. Yeah, Arthur. You know, actually, I think a good way of understanding, um, um, what's his face? The way of understanding Henry VIII's kind of physical development is kind of a bit like Alex Jones. And, <laughs> he you know, is Welsh. Uh, he is Welsh. Yeah, like, if you look at Alex Jones, like, he used to be really, like, fucking, like, fit. into sport. Yeah, it fit when he was, like, in his 20s. But as time has gone on, like, let's just put it this way. The Superman vitality hasn't been doing him any favours. So he's kind of a bit like that until eventually it reaches a precipice and he obviously kicks it because he's too fucking fat. <laughs> Alex Jones is... I don't know. Alex Jones seems a lot more fit than Henry VIII does. Yeah, but his his physique has kind of he's, deteriorated it, it, it's again. A it's again, he's Welsh. They're both Welsh. Yeah. I mean, I mean Alex Jones is the most Welsh-looking person on the face of the earth, but... <laughs> Well, you haven't seen me. <laughs> but sure. no, I mean, that's true. That's true. But uh, well, you said I kind of look like you, but yeah, but you're shorter than me, so that's that's true. Thanks, thanks. But uh, I think the concern is that uh, there's a because so we can start stick, sticking two fingers up to the Catholics here. Uh, I can say that like um you know when when they try and associate you know Protestants with Henry VIII, that's not true at all. He absolutely despised Martin Luther. He started. I think it was like yeah, he wrote. He began uh, writing his own uh, treaties against Mar against Luther and heresies, and uh, he got the and the and the, uh, the papacy dispensed on him the title of defender of the faith for his criticisms of Martin Luther. And even during his reign, um, that he forbid any sort of Lutheran teachings. And even when he reformed the even when he broke from the from the uh, Roman Catholic Church, he effectively tried to keep the Church of England to be as Catholic as possible. Just with him at the head of it instead of the Pope, uh, and there was a huge, huge uh, uh, conflict over the just the idea of transubstantiation. And uh, in the book I've read, uh, "The English and the History" by Robert Tomes, uh, it talked about how you sort of had a split between the the new Protestants in on after uh, the split from the Catholic Church between yeah. just the conservative traditionalists that wanted to keep a lot more Catholic teachings and were and then what were called the evangelicals, who were, who I think you can almost sort of, um, they they can almost be, uh, they're, they're sort of the proto high Anglican, Anglo Catholics, the ones who, um, eventually the ones who wanted to bring you know England back into the Catholic Church under Mary Tudor and the, and uh, the Sp and Philip II, and then the yeah. evangelicals slowly sort of evolved into becoming the Puritans, and uh, essentially this was a matter that was that was only you know. The extremists on both ends were, you know, murdering each other. You had martyrs on both sides. You know, you had uh, Saint John Fisher and Tom, Sir Thomas More murdered, and then eventually, under Mary Tudor, you'd get uh, uh, Cranmer, Cr Cran Cranmer, yeah. and Latimer, and uh, a bunch of other people. No, it's like I think it's Cook or Cook or something. I can't, I can't remember. Yeah, right. yeah. So I, I think though the whole transubstantiation argument, or at least the way it was treated within the Anglican Church, sort of solidified under Edward V. So it's probably mm -hmm. more pertinent to like focus on that when we're talking about Edward V, because that's a very interesting time period that not many people mm -hmm. know about at all. So, yeah, yeah. Henry VIII. <laughs> Henry VIII. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, one of the when Henry VIII, one of the earliest things that happened in his career was his joining the League of Cambrai in around 1513. So, right, England had already lost a lot of ground to France in the Hundred Years' War, everything but Calais. Yeah. And so Henry V, uh, being an ally of Spain via marriage with Catherine of Aragon, wanted to use that uh, war in order to expand English holdings in France again. And so one of the important aspects of this was the Battle of Flodden, which in 1513, the Scots, who were allies of the French, invaded England. And they, um, for the, it was, for the 15th. Yeah, for, time. yeah, exactly. And they got they got pretty much smashed by the Earl of Surrey. The, uh, I mean, basically, when when the English conquered the Scots uh, under Edward Longshanks, their longbows were decisive in uh, breaking up the Scottish pike blocks. And it fought in while there were some cannons used by the English. Uh, again, the battle was mostly decided by the bill, which is a firing implement. It's about eight feet long and it's used to trim branches, but can also double as a halberd and the longbow and the scots pretty much got wrecked um that's that's pretty much what happened and yeah. um then what happened another important thing was the early years of his reign was was the wolsey thomas the wolsey, wolsey yeah who um basically was just like his his mentor was fat and liked to dress well and eat well and um he sort of was the spider at the middle of the web he sort of had in you know eyes and ears everywhere and Basically, all important decisions that were made were made through him. And in fact, at, at various times, he, he angled to become Pope himself, which Henry VIII mm -hmm. liked that idea because an English Pope would have given him tremendous influence. Um, mm -hmm. Wolsey finally fell from grace when he could not provide an annulment for Henry VIII's marriage with, Anna, um, with Catherine of Aragon and because she failed to provide a male heir. And once he failed to get a annulment from and the reason why it was the pope at the time was basically i don't forget the pope at the time but he was allied to one of the, the sixth i think he was allied to spain i think it was a spanish appointment and wait, of course wait, the wait, pope wait. what in 1528 around there yeah so yeah, the yeah i think it was yeah i think it was no no not coming i think it was i think it was leo the 10th or was that earlier on leo, leo the 10th uh no yeah leo the 10th was um Leo X was 1513 to 1521. After him was Adrian VI, who was 1522 to 1523. Then Clement VII, 1523 to 1534. To be fair, though, it did take um, the Habsburgs sacking Rome to get to that position. Yeah, <laughs> but basically, basically what happened is because, as you pointed out, Charles V had conquered Rome, and the Pope had to be very careful who what he did. He wasn't going to give an annulment between Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII because the Spanish who, who were occupying Rome would be very unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so Mr. Fixit Woolsey was beheaded because he failed to give Henry what he wanted. As many people who failed to give Henry what he wanted ended up beheaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Henry was a bit of a bastard like that. <laughs> no. Yeah, he was. <laughs> no, he wouldn't do anything. He didn't do nothing. He was a good boy. He a good boy. Oh, he, oh, he was just a good Welshman. He, he, uh, he just wanted a divorce and a son. I think it's very, I think it's very, it, it almost seems like the fates were just aligned to sort Wolsey of... Wolsey was killed, though, I think. Um, there's just someone in the chat saying that Wolsey wasn't beheaded. I, I'm pretty certain he was executed in some way. Because, like, I seem to recall that. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. uh, okay. No, he didn't. <laughs> Well, that's why. Oh uh, yeah, no, no. He died. He was arrested, but died on the way to execution. So uh, um, presumably well, he would have been beheaded, but he died on the way to execution. That was probably a bit of a letdown then. It's like, oh. <laughs> they reckon he died of old age, but I'm not seeing it. <laughs> he died of old age on the way to his execution. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, but um, what else about? Oh, so oh, yeah, he Roma was executed. Yeah. He. So then, uh, his his break from the oh, should we talk about his break from when he finally breaks from the uh, from the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah, he he not only saw it as a on as an opportunity to obviously marry Anne Boleyn, who was a very committed Protestant, but he also saw the chantry in the monastic lands as a means of making a lot of money through rents. So he thought, well, hey, I can not only boost the economy, I can also get a new waifu in the process. <laughs> so 
Henry VIII got his second waifu and sort of broke from the church over about the course of, I think it was three years, where mm -hmm. in Parliament and the council, which wasn't yet the Privy Council, but it becomes later on, passed a bunch of legislation annulling the governance of the papacy over the British land, well, English land, as mm -hmm. well as like codifying very basic Anglican practice. Somebody so, so so Alfred the Alpha Great in the chat says, "Seize the monasteries of production." So basically, this is the uh, the the anime nerd's guide to the history of England. Yes, yes. Somebody needs to make the anime of Henry of the Tudors, the anime oh, version of that have. miniseries, The Tudors. Anne Boleyn is Kawhi. <laughs> yes. Well, she's played by Natalie Dormer, who is from who's on Game of Thrones. She's Kawhi Desu. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I did. I did. I did watch a couple years ago the the whole miniseries of the Tudors, but. It yeah, boring. Don't, yeah, it yeah don't, boring. don't watch it. Don't watch it. If you want to watch a really good mini series on Elizabeth the First specifically, there's a really old um, mm. one. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Elizabeth R. And my history teacher initially recommended it to me, and he's a bit mm. of a dork, so I thought <laughs> it's probably going to be really shit. But I ended up binge watching it before my exams, yep. and it's really good. Did you watch the Borgias? Um, I haven't. No, it's it, it's it, better than a lot of the. Uh, it's better than Spartacus, I know that much. Yeah. Well, no, no, no mini series. Come on, no mini series is better than uh, historical mini series is better than Fall of Eagles. But we can get to that much later. <laughs> but anyway, so the one thing you know, as uh, Fred, as you said, uh, to give one to the Catholics again, they like to go on their martyr complex with Sir Thomas More and Saint but, John Fisher. But the problem is, Sir Thomas More was a butcher. He killed many Protestants under uh, yes. Mary, which again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but... Thomas More? Are you sure you've got the right one? Yeah, so Thomas More, Thomas yeah, he, was, he hunted down and, and killed Protestants. I mean, it's just what... It's not called It's Mary. called karma. It's, it's, it's called Mary. karma. <laughs> yeah, not under Mary, though, I don't think. Cranmer well, maybe, did the, well, Cranmer and Latimer effectively did the same thing in reverse. They also helped hunt down and kill... Uh, no, I don't God. think they hunted down and killed, but one of them was preaching at a burning of a Catholic. It wasn't. It wasn't Thomas More. It was. Um. It was Bonner, uh, the bur burning Bonner, the um bishop uh, you, of London who. Are you sure? Tom I'm pretty sure Thomas More did kill Protestants. He probably did, but I doubt he did it under Mary. That's what well, I'm okay, not Mary, but. Yeah, like under Mary, it was Bonner, and to a le to a much lesser extent, it was Gardena. So, mm -hmm. bishops of um London and Winchester, respectively. All right. No, that's out of the way. <laughs> yeah, that's out of the way. Uh, so Henry's broken with the Church of England. What else? What else? Yeah, yes, Henry VIII is broken with the Church of England to form the Church of England, England. That's right. To, yeah, he needs to form his own little church because the other one is just too... It's it's not... It doesn't put him as, as supreme uh, god. <laughs> hmm. He needs to be... Henry VIII, I think, wanted to be god emperor. Yeah, he well, in a lot a of ways, there's a similarity between what would later happen in Russia with Peter the Great, where the Tsar was head of the church, and the church was essentially a subordinate to state power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that Henry VIII was a bit of an arrogant bastard. <laughs> no. Yeah, yes. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. And Henry uh, equals Trump. That implies that Henry did good things. <laughs> it's, it implies that Henry wanted to make England great again. Nah, he was in it for himself mostly. And he was in it for himself. He, I mean, ah, <sighs> uh, he was a really horrific king. I think if Edward V had lasted um long enough to actually succeed the throne himself, based on what I've read about him, he would have been an extremely good king. But Henry, Henry Edward is, uh, yeah, Henry's son from you mean Edward the Sixth. No, I think it's Edward the Fifth because Edward the Fourth ruled. Um, no, it says Ed, it says Edward. It says Edward the Sixth here. So does it? Yeah, you... Wiki, just Wikipedia. It's um, Edward the Sixth, King of uh, King of England oh, yeah, and, okay. and Ireland. Okay, I thought Edward the Fifth was Edward the Fourth. So <laughs> I mean, okay, much... Edward the Sixth. Then okay. I mean, I mean not much you know else. I mean, I mean, what else has to be said about? Um, I mean, he did he did kick help kickstart the English Navy with the with his uh, flagship, the Mary Rose. So that was oh, that ended well, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it sank. It sank, and everyone died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it sunk in a little battle. No, I think it. I think no. What was Wasn't it? it? I think it was when the French so, uh, sailed up the River Solent near Southampton, and. Mm. Ended up wrecking the English Navy because yeah. it, was it was a different. It was a different. Uh, oh yeah, there was a different. Um, 
instance where I think it was one of the one of the heirs. I think it was one of the heirs to Mary to Mary Tudor uh, died when the when he was on a ship in the in the English Channel and the the the, the captain was drunk and sailed in a bunch of rocks and everyone died. <laughs> yeah, so that was great. Don't don't drink and sail. Kids. Don't drink and sail, kids. Yes. Um. <laughs> I mean, should we talk about? So, should we talk a little bit about Anne Boleyn? <laughs> yeah, she was um, she was um, the first Protestant waifu of um, Henry VIII. Wife. She, he he did he did actually marry her. She's not a waifu at that point. Okay, so she's a wife, but also a waifu. All right. <laughs> and she, and she was an extremely intelligent woman by all of her all of her accounts. She's like she's what Christy Winters wishes she wishes she was, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and, so well, she, also far more attractive. Oh yeah, but that's not. But like, I've I've got shoes. Like I've got shoes that are more attractive than Christy Winters, so it's not really saying much. Kevin Logan is more attractive than Christy Winters. Uh, Kevin Logan probably has bigger tits as well. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so you know, Kevin Logan looks a little like Henry the Eighth, doesn't he? Yeah, I, yeah. He, if he Henry the Eighth like... was a fat guy, was he was even fatter and was from Manchester. Oh bloody! I don't think no. He he's not from Manchester. He sounds more Birmingham to me. Birmingham, yeah, whatever. Um. Yeah, and yeah, so and... she she had a huge amount of power in the like there was no privy council at that point, but she had a lot of court influence, and that's partly what got her in contact with Henry because she had a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. So, and then they had their little thing, and Catherine of Aragon was kind of apathetic to us, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I, all, I, all I can remember from the miniseries is that Catherine of Aragon was just. You you really sort of hated Catherine because she just so acted like this sort of stuck up bitch. Oh yeah, she she was a fucking she was a tough old bird like she was Isabella of Castile. She's child, also way so. older. She was also way older than Henry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Catherine was a literal cut queen. <laughs> well, she was. She, no, she was a. She was a. She was a cougar. Yeah, in America, that's what it is in America: is the the older women that go after young rich guys. Yeah, they called that in this country as well. Mm, mm. Yeah, the thing is though is that as time went on, there was rumors of her going around at um Anne Boleyn this is going around and yeah, like, sleeping know, with shagging, other guys, <laughs> shagging the other blokes in the court. So Emery was off of their head. With it. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, also, also, she didn't give him a daughter. She had a bunch of miscarriages, and like uh, all all the the males died, and then um. That must have been horrible. That must have been a horrible job. Is like to like so you know she had a miscarriage and it was revealed, or it's like she had a miscarriage or whatever, and uh, the the dead baby was a boy. That would have been awful to have to have to like uh, have to point that out of looking at the dead baby of the looking. The, oh, I don't want to think about that. Thanks for thanks for giving me that mental image for it. So I'm gonna have nightmares tonight. Well, how do you think they felt? <laughs> I mean, I suppose at least I'm not having the miscarriage. But then again, I'm a bloke, so I wouldn't. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you'd have to identify it. So, but anyway, anyways, um, moving on. Off, uh, she gives birth to a daughter named Elizabeth. Off their head. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to. Yeah, she was originally labelled a, a um, witch because she had very <laughs> Lutheran ideas about religion. Yeah. Again, I think I was trying to go off on that. That was my point. Is that you know, um, to the Catholics, uh, Henry VIII was no friend of sort of. Of re of sort of real Protestants outside of his high Anglican Anglicanism, uh, he ba he he, out he forbid any sort of uh, Luther what was called Lutheran teaching. So any sort of you know pro more Protestantism. Yeah, he believed in a lot of the sacraments of um, Catholicism. I think I think he got rid of like purgatory though. I think. Yeah, well, they're in purgatory if you have to deal with Henry the Eighth. <laughs> <laughs> that that's punishment enough if you're just like, oh god, he's gonna, is he gonna kill me today, or is he gonna eat and fuck at the same time? <laughs> well, that's the funniest. That's always the funniest thing people find about the Anglicans. It's like it looks Catholic, but it sounds Protestant. Well, yeah, it's basically just Catholicism split from the papacy. That's it's, all it really it's, it's, was. It's ca that they're point. Catholic, but they're not Roman Catholic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'd they're reformed, was... but they're not Protestant. <laughs> Oh, they're not they're not reformed by any stretch of the imagination. Well, like, the, the transubstantiation isn't is is they don't have trans transubstantiation isn't a thing in, I don't think in Anglicanism. I don't think it is, but that's more because I think it was Edward V and um Cranmer's reforms sixth. as well as the sixth. I keep getting it wrong. 
sixth. All right. You, you get it, you get it wrong again. I'm gonna push the button. You're gonna you're gonna fall into a little trap door and have to fight the Rancor from Star Wars Episode Six. <laughs> you're gonna smother me in barbecue sauce and have to run away from Henry VIII. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're gonna have to dress up. No, no, worse. You're gonna have to dress up like a like a, like an attractive woman and have to run away, away from Henry the Eighth. Oh God! You just said Henry the Sixth too. So, well, let's not forget uh, Thomas Cramner. Of course, he was the guy that, um, after Wolsey fell, was used to replace him. And of course, he gave. No, I think that was um, that was Thomas Cromwell, and then it Thomas was Cromwell. Cranmer. Oh, that's like, right. Cranmer, Cranmer was already the Archbishop of Canterbury at that point, appointed by the Pope, in fact. Yeah. And he Actually, was killed yeah. as a heretical Protestant. You know, you know what's funny is uh, in the I think the main pic- the the Wikipedia main picture of him, somebody uh, photoshopped Peter Hitchens' face onto him. Oh Jesus Christ! And it's like he's he's this big sort of. I'll show I'll show you the picture. Christopher Cranmer, fucking hell! <laughs> no, no, Peter Hitchens, the good one. Oh, oh, okay. So not the not the massively fat one, the normal one. No, the, right. the 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 one that the one the better the better uh, Hitchens brother. Okay. Yeah, just imagine Peter Hitchens' face on this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, but what else? Oh, who was yeah, the third? Does. Fucking does as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So third wife, Jane Seymour. Finally, yeah. gives him, finally gives him a son. Was it? No, it was Catherine Parr who was the third wife. Jane Seymour. No, no, was the, 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 third, was no the third wife was the third. No, the the Jane Seymour was the third. No, I'm pretty certain Jane Seymour was the fifth, and then it was Catherine. No, Jane Seymour was the third. All right, I'm. And she I'm, was the and she was the mother of Edward VI. Yeah, like I knew the third one was the because it's like we had it drilled into us at school: divorce, bad headed, died, divorce. Yeah, yeah, the, I remember the same thing. Yeah, and uh, when I was well, then wait, if she gave him a son, then why did he kill her or get rid of her? She just died. No, I think she she, just, she died of childbirth like a week later of like bleed. Yeah, no, yeah, two two weeks later she just died. <laughs> That's too bad, but if he already had a son, it should be it should be good, right? Yeah, no, no, no but he still wants to he still wants to have sex and have a wife. So, Jerem- oh, oh, he married Anne of Cleves, wasn't that also? Wasn't that so we could um sort of so get into the good graces of the pro- of the Protestant German uh, of the yeah. Protestant mm-hmm. German provinces? He, yeah, he sort he of was- wanted to join the Protestant League. He was trying to ingratiate himself with what was called the Schmalkaldic leader at that point. So she married Anne of Cle- he married Anne of Cleves, thinking she was a real beaut. And then she gets there, and as I already said, she kind of looks a bit like Rosie O'Donnell. So he just dumps her right there on the spot. No, nah, nah, that's an insult to Anne of Cleves. Come on, she looked a little better. She looked a bit frumpy. I think I imagine she would be sort of frumpy and you know, plain looking. Yeah, it's like not lo- not like a stunner by any. No, by any no, she's not. She's not a. She's not a. Yeah, she's not a Swedish model. <laughs> Now, although like we'll get onto that later on, but um, Elizabeth the first almost married the ki- the Mad King of Sweden. Yeah, er- so. Eric the fifteenth. Eric the fourteenth. I-, I love how like there's. I love how in like Sweden, I like how in a lot of Scandinavian countries, the um, like the 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 sort of uh, numbers after the name have got got get sort of ridiculously high because they haven't had as many sort of succession. They haven't had as many dynastic changes. Yeah, although there's also like a foundation myth surrounding it as well. There's like other kings that are mythical, and that's what it's based off of. Mm-hmm. Although Eric the Fourteenth or Eric the Sixteenth, I can't remember which one, is really interesting because he murdered half of his court in one night and had to be restrained and executed by his brother or something. <laughs> well, you also know. Well, we have to refrain when we get to uh, a fun story. When we get to, I know a lot more about Elizabeth. Don't worry. Um, I'm. But... Well, I got an A level in it, and I came top of my class in it. So excellent, it. excellent, it's great. Um, yeah, yeah. Henry VIII, the larger than life, literally. Ha ha ha. Uh, don't mm-hmm. actually have that much to talk about. I mean, it's sort of very plain. He was sort of just a freak. I don't know. Although I think I think if we're gonna are we gonna go on to Henry the sixth sixth right now eighth so Edward this Edward the sixth I don't this, this is my uh, Edward the eighth all right <laughs> Edward the eighth yeah Edward the eighth was in the nineteen thirties he was the one who had to um married a fucking yank <laughs> a, a divorced yank and then you got the and then they made a movie about it called yeah. King's Speech yeah but if we're gonna move on to that I'd like to talk a little bit about the Hitler. crisis that. <laughs> Yes, Hitler. He came to power in 1533. Definitely. No, 1588. Remember, 15. No, he, he came to power in 1488. He came to power in 1488. 
<laughs> yeah, he did. He, he and and uh, and, and yeah. he revived the the ancient Germanic myths that they they came from a race of Tibetan giants. Yeah. So before we do that, because this is really important to understanding the later Tudor era, is that look, there was two, there was two different, um, how do I put it, groups that were under the king Henry VIII. Um, there was the council, and then there was something the Privy Seal, I think it was, and mm -hmm. these combined in the early 1540s to become the Privy Council. And that's really important because it has a massive influence on what the other people do, and it's all it's all shrunk and like increased in size, dependent on kings and queens afterwards. But it's extremely important, and it also plays a strong hand in understanding how how England developed under Edward the Sixth, because at the end of Henry's reign, obviously, you know, he's like the pies are really catching up with him. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's, I think, I think I think his, I think he couldn't even walk anymore. Or his leg got infected or something because he was so fat. And yeah, uh, he, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure. Well, no, he wasn't a woman, so he doesn't count. He, 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 he men, was, you can't you can't be men can't be fat. Fat is power plus privilege. Yeah, he was basically boogie uh, two nine eight eight at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, Catherine Paul was sort of the carer, you know, had to clean out the colostomy bag things like. Well, that. Well, before her, actually, the the second to last wife was Catherine Howard. Yeah, who was a bit of a slag. <laughs> yeah, she did actually sleep around, and then I think he killed her. Yeah. And her lover as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Had him killed. But at this, as this was going on, there was two different um, factions within the Privy Council. There was the Reformers, and there was the Traditionalists. And the Traditionalists were composed of people like Gardena, I think... No, I suppose Big Odd had been gone by then, but I think it was the Duke of Norfolk. Um, and these were like traditionalists. They wanted a more Catholic church, more like little C Catholic, you know, like obviously you've got like the divine governor that's the king, but mm -hmm. you know, then yeah. you've got the reformers. Essentially there are more like high Anglicans versus evangelicals. Yeah. yeah and I do, got... and I do great with the evangelicals. They love me. Going to be huge. Yeah. So, Big and, and then you've got the other ones who are sort of proto evangelicals, people like who Grammar. eventually Cranmer, then Latimer, the, yeah, Latimer. Then the Earl of Hereford becomes the Duke of Somerset after Henry dies. The Duke of Northumberland, John Dudley, and they eventually win in the court battles. Like they don't actually have like like fist fights and shit, but they're like you know political maneuvering, kind of like what happens. They play, uh, they play games of Warhammer, basically. They play uh, they play like uh, tabletop RPGs. Yeah, like fucking Thomas Latimer sitting there with his block of space marines just fucking <laughs> annihilates some um, <laughs> fucking fucking Gardena's tyranids, and it's like, re, re, you, you fucking nor me, you know? You know, get, get, that, get, off my, get off my council. This, this is a bit, this is a bit uh, related, but like, uh, I think distributors made a good point. Is that you should? It, it seems like um, uh, the 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 world of Warhammer 40k. It, it seems like it's almost like a Methodist or it's like a Protestant. Sort of, uh, it's a very sort of distorted view of how like Protestants or other people view Catholicism. Mm. You know, it, I mean, I mean, come on, I mean, uh, the the emperor, the um, the Imperium of Man is absolutely based on Catholicism. Well, yeah, a very strong form of Catholicism, like a Jesuit version, like very, very. Well, no, Je Jesuit is not strong Catholicism. That's that's the that's the weak version of Catholicism. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, in the, it's like. I mean, I, I could you could compare the Inquisition and the operation of the Jesuit order to I don't know the order order so, heretical. So, so order. I suppose I suppose then in this in that universe, um, uh, one of one of the one of the the one of the chaos one of the members of the chaos faction nailed uh, ninety five problems he had with the Imperium onto a cathedral door. Yeah. <laughs> And and, um, and and like the and then eventually you have the 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 chaos section like they're singing like hit they're singing like Christian rock hymns while like laid waving <laughs> their hands in the air like like fill our hearts Jesus and it's like re really fucking fucking <laughs> fucking fucking heretics get off get off my planet re really. <laughs> yeah but back back to back to the fat bastard of um, Heinrich the fifth sixth eighth Heinrich you mean Henry? Heinrich Henry whatever um. Last, do we have anything to say about Catherine Parr? Uh, she was kind of his carer, you know. Like she, she had a kid with him, didn't she? No, she never had a kid with Catherine Parr. No, she he had didn't. a kid with. Yeah, no, 
No, he didn't. He. No, I know what happened to Catherine Parr. After Henry died, she oh, remarried... Thomas Seymour. Thomas Seymour. Yeah, remarried Thomas Seymour, who was the brother of Seymour, <laughs> the Duke of Somerset. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it was like yeah, three yeah, years. You, you, you Brits and your Europeans with all your fancy dynasty names, you all need something simple like we got America. Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't be really that entertaining if like the Trump <laughs> the Trump dynasty had a civil war with the Clinton dynasty. It would just well, sort of did. It. Well, we it did. It was much peace more peaceful though. Well, <laughs> Henry VIII is Nurgle. That's pretty appropriate. Can you imagine being Catherine Parr and having to wash him every day? <laughs> well, actually, um, I can, I can, I can sort of imagine. Well, I've worked at. I haven't. I didn't actually do that, but uh, my dad and I've worked at. Have worked at nursing homes. Uh, yeah. I, well, I worked there as security and like also just like food. Uh, you know, delivering food carts up. But I can't imagine. But most of the people that work there are like nurses, and that's essentially what they have to do. Yeah, I have a friend who's a um, private nurse, and she goes to like victims of strokes and things like that and she goes along and cleans them up and it's pretty fucking disgusting although none of them are quite as fat as henry the eighth as far as i know so no, no, like... no 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 but well, don't worry Does, doesn't she just use like a fire hose and just spray him down <laughs> no, <laughs> just take, takes him outside and takes him into the backyard and just like starts spraying them with the water hose Oh, I don't. I don't think that's that actually. Work. That's actually pretty cruel. I'm, that's mean. I feel bad. They're like eight. That. They're like eighty, and if they die, like she, she's like accountable. So you know. <laughs> Wait, she's a cannibal? No, she, no, she's accountable, not a cannibal. <laughs> it's like how she eats them after she kills. After she, that's why she has to clean them up first. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah. At this point, at this point, Henry the Eighth is basically fucking Boogie Two Nine Eight Eight. That that's what he looks like. He's kind of. He's just a blob on a bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd probably be playing World of Warcraft if they had it. <laughs> yeah, you he know. would be. Uh, you know, it, they'd have they'd have something. They'd have like a, they'd have like a big like sort of um sort of like game board in in a, like one of the one of the rooms in the castle of a, a palace and just have like essentially just be that on. They'd have like this whole weird like mechanical device that you could basically play video games. <laughs> oh, Christ! <laughs> Somebody said he looks like T.J. Kirk. <laughs> He doesn't. He okay. TJ is not that fat. He looks more like Paul Zigo, I'd say, because mm -hmm. Paul Zigo is like three hundred and fifty pounds or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Boogie's so blue pill. You're right. Uh, Alfred the Great. Alfred the. We should have talked about Alfred. I love Alfred the Great. He was awesome. Yeah, but that's like five hundred years before. Yeah, that's that's actually, before the Protestantism. Actually, I know exactly what Henry the Eighth probably looked like in the fifteen thirties. You know who? You know Alexander Jahans? No, fifteen. That's when he took. That's when he broke from the Church of England. Broke, broke from the Roman Catholic Church. He yeah, died like, in. He died in fifteen forty seven. So I think you're talking more about what he would look like in the fifteen forties. Yeah, if we, no, I'm talking about how he developed over time. So if he if he started as Alex Jones. And then he went to Alexander Jahans, and now he's fucking Boogie2988 slash, slash Paul Zigo sort of look. Mm -hmm. EJ is fat, but he's not that fat. Fuck you, Eric Paul. I'm not going to make less podcast. <laughs> Disable ad docker. Yeah, right. I don't even do that when I watch my own videos, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but um, should we move on to a little lesser known, because I think we're getting fed up with this, is... Um, uh, Ever the sixth. So your your assertion is that he could have been actually a very good king. He was a fucking genius. He was producing like proper big treatises, like um, John Locke's treatise at like the age of nine. He knew six languages. The guy w was like proper fucking hunter. He was pretty fucking hench, you know. And he he was, and like he's not the sickly child that Wig and older historians betray him as. He was very very fit. He was he was always out hunting. He was almost a warrior, but he didn't really have all that much control because he was about nine when his dad died. Mm -hmm. So the person who controlled in his place was the Lord Protector, then the Earl of Hereford, who became the Duke of Somerset. Now this guy was probably one of the best commanders of in like in tactical for in like tactical soldiers like. Like a really good tactical commander. He's comparable to the Duke of Parma, I'd say. And eventually, um, he I, after about three or four months of Henry dying, he died in January 1547. Uh, 
like like what's his name somerset goes full retard and goes hey let's invade scotland completely rapes the um the scottish forces at the battle of pinky and pushes them into the highlands but the trouble is is that obviously the old alliance which the is highlands. the highlands <laughs> yeah pushes them into the highlands takes the lowlands and then the french get involved and so it's basically like the korean war then so you know put, put the scottish invade northern england english push them out the english push them back no 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 we like the english just invaded because they thought that's what henry wanted as dead it's more like no, no, well that, that's the korean war is the evil dirty capitalist americans and south koreans invaded the, the glorious republic of north korea i'd say it was probably more like the soviet afghan war Mm, mm. Stop spoiling my level course. I already did it, mate. <laughs> yeah, I already did it. I nailed it, man. It's it's pretty decent course. So as I was saying, yeah. So basically, it devolved into guerrilla warfare, and the soldiers got put into like forts, and they all died of fucking dysentery because you know that's what it's like sitting in a fucking fortress all day in Scotland. And in fucking Scotland, I can't imagine a worse place to be, apart from maybe Somalia. At mm. least the food's Som good in Somalia. <laughs> Yeah, I remember there was like some comedian talking about how a Scot he was like from Scotland. He's like Scotland has the was rated having the worst diet on earth. That means we have a worse diet than starving children in Ethiopia. Yeah, I mean at least when at least when the Ethiopians they, they eat with class, like their food's pretty decent. But if you have a fried Mars bar and a fucking haggis, like Jesus Christ, it's asking for a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, don't worry, the Scot. Well, uh, unfortunately, then the Scots are going to come to rule England for a hundred for about a hundred I mean, years. I mean, there's a reason why Glasgow's got like a a life expectancy of like 65. It isn't because they're always having fights. It's because they're eating like literal shit. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you could eat a full English every day and expect to live to about 70. And these people eat even worse than that. Like Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we should. I think it's another cool thing. Is uh, so, uh, Todd, do you have anything to talk about uh, Edward the Eighth, Edward the Sixth? No, not about Edward. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but so, we need... so he so wait, what battles was he involved with? You said he was actually a good tactical commander. Uh, Duke of Somerset was. He okay. fought at the back, Battle of Pinky, and he also fought in France uh, to try and defend, um, like because they sort of still controlled Calais and sort of the surrounding area. And although he got wrecked by the French because the French were more powerful, he was a really good tactical commander because he could sort of maneuver his troops really well. He mm -hmm. was he was a lot like as I say like. Alexander Farnese, the Duke of Parma, because he was a really good at that. He was just really, really shit at the fucking mm -hmm. like strategic level. So he ended up having his soldiers sort of die of like disease. It was really bad with um. Just build another wall. Island. Just just rebuild Hadrian's Wall and make Ireland pay for it. Yeah, but the Irish have not any money. What they pay me with potatoes? Come on. <laughs> they don't know. They didn't have potato. I don't think they had potatoes yet. Okay, they they pay they pay you with kind of like I don't know um, nothing. Shamrock like the, the leaves. Pot, the, the pot of gold at the end of the fucking rainbow. I don't know. <laughs> well, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to the Irish. We'll get to the Irish. Don't worry. Yeah, um, but also there's also a lot of developments that happen economically under Edward the Sixth. So you're familiar with the idea of enclosure, right? Yeah. So the idea of enclosure for the audience is that there's like fencing. And like, no, not like not like the sport, but like fencing on fields and things. Now the yeah, thing actually, is, I, yeah, if I could, I think, uh, yeah. Whereas before, essentially, peasants farmed in, um, you know, uh, you there, there's sort of a giant patch of land that you'd sort of go outside of your house, and everyone would sort of collectively farm that. But then it's sort of sort of that, getting uh, actually now, yeah, now you can. Uh, that's what that's what the problem was because what happened is that the lords, and especially in like East Anglia started to fence off parts of the common land and charge the peasants to use it. So they were getting really pissed off, as you'd imagine, because it's like common land and you've got to graze your sheep somehow. So Somerset tries to solve this with the Midlands Commission, which is a basically a law which tries to get rid of illegal enclosures. But the thing is with this is that it, encur it seems to encourage vigilantism to remove these enclosures. And that's what leads to an event called Ket's Rebellion. So Ket's, Ket's Rebellion was basically started when a group of um, farmers from what is now East Anglia near Norwich, under a guy called Robert Ket and his family, started tearing down illegal enclosures and eventually, eventually they asked for a legal representative from the king, but they never got one. So 
Robert Kett acted as a lawyer. And when they got to Norwich, they wouldn't let them in. So they sort of went, Re, Re, you're not letting me you're not letting me into your city. And they besieged it. Don't you um, want to be multicultural and tolerant? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, biggest, like, fucking huge rebellion, like 10,000 farmers sitting outside of Norwich, which at that point was one of the largest cities in the country. And eventually it got smashed by the Duke of Northumberland, who was the Earl of Warwick at that point. So, you know, farms are important. <laughs> that's, that's how you could pretty much sum it up. But there's a, a lot goes on in 1549, and we could probably be here for an hour talking about it, so I'll sort of move on. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think we should move on to uh, Lady... Jane Grey. Uh, I think now we can move on to Mary the First. <laughs> uh, you're, you're sort of skipping. A, you're, skip, you're skipping a lot of religious movement, but all right. Yeah, sure. Actually, yeah, we can talk about that. We can talk about that because Cranmer, to... Cranmer worked really hard on prayer books and things. There was one that was published in 1549, as I said, which that, was. Very... And that was the uh, wasn't that one of the predecessors to the Book of Common Prayer? Yeah, and that's what caused a rebellion in Cornwall. But since we've got an hour and a half and not fucking six hours, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, as time went on, there was a power struggle between the Duke of Northumberland. Um, I think it was the Earl of Southampton at one point, because the Duke of Northumberland, who was the Earl of Warwick at that point, removed Somerset because he was doing really shit things with the country. Because there's riots everywhere. There was literally about three rebellions going on at once in 1549, so he got removed. And then there was a big struggle between Southampton and Warwick. And there was a massive outbreak of, I think it was sweating sickness, and that killed uh, Southampton. So eventually, Northumberland came to control, and Northumberland was one of these, like, not proto Calvinists, I'd say maybe, very strongly Protestant. And this influenced Cranmer, who in 1553 published a prayer book which was very much Protestant, removed all references to transubstantiation, and removed. Mary. Yeah, and then Mary, and eventually, and it even removed references to an altar and everything. Mm -hmm. So very, very Protestant until Edward unexpectedly kicks it, and there's a huge issue surrounding his testament, which was supposed to make uh, Northumberland <clears throat> king, I think. But there was like, oh, he might have forged it. So there was like, sort of like a three-day-long civil war, and eventually um, Mary came to power in well, June after, well after, after after Lady Jane Grey is king queen for nine days, yeah, because she married um she married the um Duke of Northumberland's youngest son Guildford Dudley, mm -hmm. so that was his control basically, and she came along and basically removed Jane Grey. Yeah, Mary comes in, and then I think uh, yeah we can get we can talk a little bit about uh was she called was she the one that was known as Bloody Mary or was that the Queen of Scots? No, that was Bloody Mary. Uh, she, okay. killed two, she killed 289 Protestants, mostly in London and I think it was King, King's Lynn or something. Yeah, and she, yeah, and she's the one who helped kill. She's the one who killed Cranmer, wasn't she? Yeah, she killed Cranmer eventually. It took her a good three and a half years because. And the th yeah, the the thing is that like um you know also when they killed Latimer is the problem is it had sort of the opposite effect of like oh we're gonna show them you know we're gonna punish these horrible heretics but like when they when they let leave them to be executed everyone in the in the in London is like cheering for the for the for the uh evangelicals getting killed yeah yeah she didn't really kill like, that much she was she, she I, mean, I can't imagine I, I I still can't imagine like she then you know she marries Philip the second of Spain it's like I can't imagine how the English Protestants must have fucking hated her like oh yeah and there was also a whole council of state set up by philip ii so so they were worried that it was going to become part of the habsburg empire but they eventually oh yeah happen. yeah 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 it didn't work out of course but um i uh, she did uh, she did at least uh, eventually name elizabeth as her uh, as her successor but like you know i mean i, mean, I think that that's the thing people don't really i don't think a lot of people realize is that England was not a religiously homogenous thing yet, or ever would be, because the fact is there were still tons of Catholics and still tons of Protestants, and you know a lot of Especially you know a old. big a big yeah a lot of Catholics in the north, but and you know yeah. again you had the big spectrum of the sort of traditionalist high Anglican Anglicans and then the evangelicals. Yeah. Actually, one interesting story: there's a there was a church in a small village up in Westmoreland, which for people who don't know is very very far north of England. 
not Scotland yet. It's sort of near Durham. And mm. basically, during the English Civil War, the Roundheads marched into this town, and they were still Catholic. And they'd never, they'd never even heard about any of the reforms that happened in like 150, 110 <laughs> years before, because it was such an isolated town. It was like in the middle of like a a, a village, like a, a village, a valley, even. Isn't there a witch that's supposed to live there? I don't know. <laughs> there's like the, there's a song called "The Witch of the Westmoreland." I don't know. I I, I don't know at all, all right. but still. So like. She's underrated, Mary, and I say this as someone who's quite Protestant, because she did some. She came up with some good ideas when it came down to financial reform, but mm -hmm. she t sort of partially inherited that from Northumberland. So, mm -hmm. and she and she was also like, actually, I think we should talk about the relationship between her and Philip II because yeah, yeah, sure, sure, because she only saw Philip II three times. Mm -hmm. And, and yet she had this massive senpai relationship with her. Well, yeah, and like she just keeps like, give me a son, give me a son, so we can, you know, reunite yeah. England as Catholic. He's like, nah. Yeah, and she was like, and she was like, really, really into like Philip II, or even though he had the Habsburg jaw. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. But I think it's probably because she got she was at one point even destined to marry Charles V. So she was constantly in and out of like, I'm destined to marry this person. And eventually I think she got really obsessive over it. She's basically the female equivalent of R9K when it comes to like relationships, I think. That's the impression. You I bring got. it to 4chan, don't you? Why not? You know? Why not? Yeah, this is basically like for it's like Game of Thrones, isn't it? All, everything, every every political every political drama in, in history is just like Game of Thrones, isn't it? Which really means they're always like the War of the Roses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, are, 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 I mean, are you kidding me? The, the Lannisters and the Starks and the Lancasters and the Yorks. No, and the original mm -hmm. Shakespeare did it best. Well, of course he did. Uh, but anyways, um, can we? So after the death of. Oh yeah, so um, Mary uh, of England, Bloody Mary, dies of what? How did she die? Illness? Uh, I think it was something like stomach cancer or something. They reckon. Yeah, st st yeah uh, dies in 1558. Yes, to be succeeded by uh, Queen but, Bess. Yeah, and 1559 was a big year, so we'll start there. <laughs> yeah. Old Bess. Old Bess, um, the most overrated queen in in English history, outside of perhaps Elizabeth II. Like Elizabeth II's basically just a figurehead. She's just sort of there. She's like, "Hi yeah. there, I'm this old woman. Pay me money." <laughs> Look how nice I am. I'm going to wave in my big hats and fancy dresses. Yeah, like someone, someone, one of my she's mates. Never, she's, 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 you know, she's going to live forever, right? There, but by the time she gets, by the time she's about to die, they're gonna have invented a, a way to put her just head in a jar so she can reign forever. Anything better? Anything's better than Prince Charles becoming king? How are they gonna put him? How 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 on earth are they gonna be able to put him on all the money? How are they gonna be able to fit his ears on the money? Fuck, I don't just, know. Just, she needs to outlive him so then William can be king. Yeah, I mean, I could see William being a good king, but he's popular and young, and he's got a nice wife, and you know. He, I, prefer, I prefer her wife, his wife's sister, to be honest. But you know, I'm a, I like trashy, so you know. <laughs> so, so you'd be basically saying that. Uh, I'm, Franz, I would prefer Pippa to. Um, so you're saying that Fritz, fr that uh, Franz Josef should have married um, Helena instead of Elizabeth of Bavaria. I guess. <laughs> well, I, I I think that's truth. That's absolutely true, anyways. But any, we'll get to that much later. Um, yeah, what what, should, what can we say about uh, Queen Bess? A lot. So where do you want to start? You can start. You can start, Todd. We'll start at the start, I think. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the general arc of Queen Elizabeth's reign was, was one of moderation. She was known mm -hmm. for being very non-committal. It took her a very long time to commit to something. For instance, it took her 15 years, something or thereabouts, to finally off Queen Mary of Scotland. But... Yeah. Some people think that part of her non-committal attitude was the result of growing in fear under the reign of terror of Henry VIII. I mean, after all, he murdered her own mother. Um, and, but and, what and, and her and her own position as queen was it was it was only going to be it was so tenuous because she was effectively a bastard child. And actually, actually, I think 
like I'm sorry if I'm interrupting here, but my my history teacher who was like I think he was like a PhD from UCL reckons that she was sexually assaulted as a child. So that's yeah, why yeah. Her. By um, who was it? Um, who could it have been? I don't know. Who would have been close? Maybe I, no. It was in the it was in the book I read on this. She um, fucking hated. Um, she hated the Dudleys. I think apart from Robert Dudley, which they kind of had like a good relationship mm -hmm. with. Uh, I can I can look it up just one second. Oh, Thomas Seymour. She she said, uh, there's evidence that she was assaulted as a girl by her gar guardian, Thomas Seymour, and this left her with an aversion to sex. Yeah. That's that's quite possible. I, I, but you know, you know, the interesting thing about her is that, like, uh, you know, as her as her reign sort of uh, went on and, you know, uh, she be sort of became uh, famous as being the Virgin Queen, uh, people seemed to absolutely love her. Like, like it, she almost seemed to sort of replace uh, the Virgin Mary as a like, sort of symbol in, in England since they had left the Catholic Church. And uh, you know, reformed to be more and more Protestant because they they they, they literally it spoke of like they had this sort of cult of this Virgin Queen. People like people almost like worshipped her and worshipped this idea of this pure Virgin Queen leading England. I don't understand why she was a really bad. I think she was a really bad monarch because hmm. I mean she certainly sucked a lot of cocks in court for a yes. fucking virgin. I mean bloody hell, <laughs> she was like. She was all over the fucking place. Like she had all sorts of favourites. She had William Cecil, who was really close. She had Robert Dudley until he kicked it. Uh, yeah. Was it Robert Devereux? I think it was Robert. Yeah, Devereux. 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 Um, and then I think she, she he got he was killed or he 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 had a horrible case of um, like stalker syndrome where like he he tried to like prove his worth on the battlefield and going love me love me Elizabeth no, and then she, I, mean, I disagree. I think he was just a bit of a a cunt. Because once, because what Elizabeth would do in the court is if they disappointed her, she'd slap them physically. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, and so like, I think it was after he came back from Ireland without commands and yeah, was replaced Ireland. by Mountjoys. So Elizabeth is obviously pretty fucking pissed because why is my commander back in London when he's supposed to be fighting O'Neill? So he, he, she slaps him. And so what does fucking Devereux do? The fucking madman? He pulls out his fucking sword. Of the Queen. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, and and like the entire court is fucking surprised when the Queen does jack shit to him. It's like you could have easily killed him for that. Yeah, and again, I think it's I think it's again uh, the reason why she's sort of known for being so moderate is because of the fact that she didn't want to piss anybody off because that could help. That would have set off. That could have like she's so afraid that would have set off like sort of a powder keg and. You know, she, another she English really Civil War and another... She was really beta for a monarch. <laughs> Let's put it that way. What does that well, mean? Sorry, I'm American. Beta. You know, oh. like beta. Be beta. Oh, you know? okay. As far as her moderation, we see, I think, one of the best examples is her religious compromise. Mm -hmm. The 1559 Act of Supremacy passed by Parliament rein reinstated the anti-papal laws of Henry VIII and made the Queen the sole head of the Church. And in the Act of Uniformity, they, they they printed the second version of the prayer book. And so basically the the, the priest the Catholic priests had to swear an oath of loyalty to the queen. Uh, so either that you either put being Catholic or you become an Anglican. And um yeah, I think, in I fact think I think the Catholics would try to um send in, you know, the Jesuits and, and other Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they basically tried to uh, subvert. They were, they were trying to be subversive and trying to over eventually overthrow. Because the thing is, this was it was sort of leading up to this sort of idea that the Sp that the that the Spanish were going to invade England, and they were sort of trying to to sort of pave the way to you know let's reconvert England enough from the inside, so then they'll be more ready when we finally liberate them and bring them back into the Catholic fold. Was, but by the right time by the time she's done, most of England is still Catholic at the lay level, but at the level of leadership. Most people are Protestant, and they, and they correctly banked on the idea that well, as long as we hold the reins of power, England will slowly and I inevitably move in the Protestant direction, and that's what the Papists were afraid of. Now, but on the other side, the Puritans thought that the compromise was too Catholic, and they were upset. And P Elizabeth just crushed them. She didn't really like them. She basically made it very difficult for them to get what they wanted. Now, of course, the compromise failed because the Puritans led the, were the leading move force behind the Civil War, 
about sixty years later. Yeah, and they would. Yeah, they'd eventually win, and then that's that's essentially where my ancestors probably most likely uh, went to America because they were Puritans that wanted to go to, you know. They say stuff like, uh, oh, the, the pilgrims came to for religious freedom. Yes, they wanted the religious freedom to set up a theocracy in America. Yeah, but to be fair, there was it was because largely... I mean, this is getting into the Stuarts, but this is because of Armenianism and... What, the Armenians? Lord, Archbishop Lord. No, no not the Armenians. <laughs> <laughs> the Ar Armenians, like Jacob Arminius. Oh, okay. Or Jacob Ar Arminius. I can't remember how it's pronounced, but this is this is this is the this is the next episode, you know. I'll, you know. I'll yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Um, but well, the, I think the other point is we have to deal with Mary, Mary, Queen of Scots, who of oh, course God. was the big thorn. And see, the thing that what Mary was afraid of was, or Elizabeth was afraid of, was that if she died, Mary would become queen. Mm -hmm. And Mary, when she became Queen of Scotland, she had a pretty sweet gig until she started doing the hanky panky with James of Bothwell, James Hepburn, the fourth Earl of Bothwell. And her own husband was murdered under mysterious circumstances. Yeah. And basically, at that point, they blamed her for murdering her husband. The Earl of Bothwell ran away. And then she had to flee to England because the Scots wanted her head. And it, was yeah. a rebel it was a civil war in Scotland, actually, between yep. the Reformed and the Traditionalists, and the Reformed mm -hmm. one. They were like four to one. Mox. And so Elizabeth, she, she asked Elizabeth to reinstate her on the throne. And Elizabeth's like, well, we have a bad precedent of a monarch being deposed, but we have a friendly Protestant Scotland, which isn't an ally to France anymore. And so Elizabeth's uh, pragmatism won out and said, well, yeah, it's unfortunate, but uh, a Protestant Scotland, which is not a French ally, is better than having you on the throne. It's, it's also... Oh, sorry. They it's also... also she tried to... Um, <laughs> Her advisors wanted her to kill Mary, but she didn't want to kill Mary because she thought that would be a, a dangerous precedent to kill a head yeah. of state. There's a lot more to it than that, though, because it's important to remember that um, it, Mary, Queen of Scots, was related to the House of Guise, oh, which were yeah. a huge fucking family in France. And yeah, they and, were very Fran close. and that's sort of the reason why a lot of the, you know, the uh, why the Spanish invasion, the Armada, was delayed for so many years is because of the fact that. They were still in huge competition with the, with, you know, they were still at war with the French, uh, and the, but in sort of in, in the things had to start aligning for the Spanish because uh, eventually the Spanish, the French themselves would sort of get themselves involved in a religious civil war with eventually uh, a French Protestant king Henry the Henry of Navarre becoming king of France. Yeah, although he did convert to Catholicism. He was like three different religions throughout his entire life, or something. Yeah. yeah, he was like he was like initially like he was initially Lutheran, I think, and then he went to Calvinist, and then he went to um yeah, Catholic. Ca yeah Catholic because he wanted to keep France united against the Guise because the Guise were fucking mega Catholic. And then and then of course there's the there's uh, you'll well know this you'll like this uh, Mauritian as the perfidious and rebellious Dutch. Yes, that keep causing problem after problem after problem for the Spanish, or you know, the Bielden storm. We'll start with that. Yeah, uh, you can. Yeah, we can talk. Well, we should. I think for a different episode, we'll talk more about like this. These the the events, the uh, the contemporary events happening on the continent. So we can talk more about that. But you yeah. know, we're trying to focus on England now. But <laughs> like, I think, I think, I think the main reason that the Anglo-Spanish War broke out was because because fucking. Elizabeth, in her brilliant wisdom, decided it would be a good idea to keep paying for soldiers and sending resources for the Dutch Republic, who rebelled against um, the Spanish formally well, in like 1580. To, to, be, to be fair, is that, uh, you know, a loss, if, uh, if the Dutch provinces were lost, then uh, that, would have made that would have made England wide open for invasion. Yeah, but at the same time, the seventeen provinces had always been a part of the well, had been a part of the, the Habsburg Empire since the death of Philip the Handsome in like fourteen eighty four or something. Mm -hmm. So, and we were never friendly with France. So, mm, I'm not sure. I think the reason she was mostly destabilizing it was because obviously the Netherlands was probably it was basically the North Italy of the English Channel. It was very rich. It like the the wool trade, which funded a lot of the English economy, used to trade through there, and without it, they'd be fucked. Mm -hmm. So they just wanted kind of economic dominance, I suppose, is probably the best way of putting it. 
that and also it was it would have been a, it would have become a base for Spanish operations and essentially that's that's sort of when we get to, when we can uh, do you want to get to the armada finally or yeah uh, before we get to the armada I want to set some things up um, one of the things is the indubitable the indomitable Sir Francis Drake yes I want to give a brief uh, biography about Drake do it he was do born it. in the early 1540s in Devonshire. Uh, the first thing that he's really known for is his voyages to the West Indies as a slave trader in the 1560s. And there was one particular, uh, uh, I think it was in the 1570s, one particular voyage he went with his brother. And see, the Spanish Empire in the New World, you were not allowed to trade if you weren't, you know, all legit with the Spanish. And so when he goes in there, they're technically illegal pirates. And they basically uh, run into some Spanish uh, ships and they swap um, each other's sailors as, you know, bargaining chips to make sure the other guy doesn't stab him in the back. Well, the Spanish completely reneged on it. They imprisoned and tortured the English prisoners, and then they attacked Drake and his fleet. And he actually saw some of his own compatriots killed by the Spanish, which sort of gave him a burning hatred of Spain. And in his um, circumnavigation of the globe in 1578 to 15... 79, he basically just plunders the Spanish Empire all over the world. And and really, when he circumnavigated the globe, that was incredible. I mean, that would be like if right after we got to the moon, um, you know, China got to the moon, some some backwater country that nobody mm -hmm. really cared about. And of and course... Actually did it, and, and actually did it, and actually managed to live all the way through. Exactly. Uh, now, between his circumnavigation of the globe and the Armada... He was basically had to be. He wasn't. He wasn't at sea much. He was basically a landowner, part of the gentry. He was a member of parliament. He was a nice boy. He played by the rules. And he was a knight. Yeah, but well, I can say this: is like in, in, in was, his, If I could interrupt just for just a second, is I can talk about um, uh, the you know, uh, him him his rating of the Spanish treasure fleets and all that. Apparently, I read in the book. Um, it made about a four thousand seven hundred percent profit <laughs> over the cost of doing it. it ba the the amount of money it, it brought back was essentially yeah it, it brought back essentially a year's worth of uh, of how much it, basically a year's worth of taxes and how much income the crown would have gotten. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, with the armada, uh, Mauritian is right. A after Elizabeth, I think it was in eighteen uh, fifteen eighty five. When she starts uh, sending money and troops to the to the Dutch uh, rebels. Oh, it was it was way before that. Like she was sending stuff to the Dutch rebels at like the late fifteen uh, sixties, actually. In fact, one of her first actions was to pay one of the the ele the prince elector of the Palatinate to send soldiers to fight against the Habsburgs. She'd been doing it for a very long time, and the Anglo-Spanish War of fifteen eighty five was only the culmination of that. Yeah, yeah. Now, when by I think it was 1586 by this point, uh, Philip is is preparing to go to war. Now you also have the you also do have a fact another factor is the, that uh, that uh, the English were making were also making uh, basically an alliance with Morocco. They were uh, yeah they they they've been uh, yeah they've been uh, they were supplying arms to King Aham Abd Al Mansur of Morocco to uh, fight against, to help fight against the Spanish. Plus the yeah. of Crato in Portugal as well. As, and also the... Well, and, and not only the... Um, wait, with the alliance. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and essentially, so just to piss off the Pope and the Catholics even more, is now you have this Protestant queen allying with the Muslims. Well, not only that, the Spanish were fed up with the, uh, the sea dogs led by Drake, who had the tacit support of Elizabeth to raid their treasure fleets. That was another thorn on the side of the Spanish. Now... Why in the world he um, f uh, Philip picked Medina Sidonia is completely beyond me because he had no proper naval training. It was purely a political appointment. And not only that, Philip micromanaged the strategy of the fleet from the beginning and wrecked it. The original Medina, author... The Medina original... Was, well, like, I just wanted to add that Medina Sidonia was actually afraid of water as well. Yeah. <laughs> The original planner was a, a guy named Bernardino de Oscalante, and he argued that the fleet should attack Ireland to draw the English fleet away from the channel and then have the Duke of Parma and his forces make a quick cross over to England by pulling away the English fleet. But 
Philip because he he was in England, I think, very briefly in the fifteen fifties when yeah. he was married to uh, yeah. Mary, and he believed that he knew better than anybody in Spain what England was like, and he just blew off Bernardino and said, "No, we're going to send a fleet to Calais, link up with Parma, and then invade England." So right from the beginning, he micromanages it in a way that's just horrible, and the the way the way the Spanish were working at it was. They had a basically a crescent formation, um, and the inside would be the transport ships, and they were rel relatively slow with relatively smaller weapons. The they, then they had on the outside the more powerful warships. So there was about, tw I think, basically around twenty some galleons for uh, Castile or the Spanish, and then most of them were armed merchant vessels. Out of the 130 ships, most of them were merchant vessels that were armed to transport the troops. And the English also had mostly merchant vessels. They only they only had around 30 warships. The the average English warship was smaller and faster than their Spanish counterpart, with more hull space for heavy cannon. Whereas yeah, they the had, and yeah, they're also more well armed. Yeah, they had like some like three to ones for like for for the average tonnage. They had like three times as many guns as the Spanish counterpart. And the Spanish, you see, a little bit back here, 17 years earlier at the Battle of Lepanto, where they smashed the Turks, Spanish naval tactics in the Mediterranean were that of boarding. You'd have uh, small guns, like the blunderbuss or a musket, and then you'd shoot at enemy sailors and try to board them and then take their ships. And it was quite effective in the Mediterranean. And that was basically the mentality of the Spanish fleet. But when the English... When they fight in the North Sea, it's a totally different environment. And, and the, the Spanish Armada was one of the first battles where the one side did not board the other. It was just where they just shot each other with guns. And the commander of the fleet was actually not Drake, the English fleet. It was, I think it was Wilson. Effingham, Howard of Effingham. Close enough. <laughs> uh, yeah. So basically, let's get to the good part. When they actually get into the channel. There's a brief skirmish where the Spanish are in their tight crescent formation and the English forces are coming at them in a more loose formation. Now, they don't come close to, too close when they bombard because they're afraid of being boarded. And they don't really do that much damage to the Spanish fleet. No. There's only one ship that's really uh, uh, damaged beyond repair, and it's an accident because it crashes into another Spanish ship. And at night, Drake who is supposed to be leading the fleet, he's supposed to be at the head of the English fleet with a lantern to lead them to follow the Spanish, decides to be a pirate and go loot the, the Spanish ship that <laughs> was all broken up in the, in the crash. And that was, I think, you know, the first, quote, victory of the day. But then they had to spend the next day getting back on topic, or back and on thank, the Spanish. And thank God, the fact, for the, thank goodness for the, uh, for the English that uh, the, who was it, the Duke of, what was the name? What was the name of the Parma, Duke of Parma? Duke of, Duke of Parma in the Netherlands uh, said get the message. No, that and also he's like, yeah, they ha he had to delay. He the the Spanish Armada had to be delayed for like a, for about a week. Uh, whilst... Well, they were delayed a lot, but the yeah. One of the important, one of the crucial turning points in the campaign was as they approached the Isle of Wight, because they had no yet no word from the Duke of Parma, um, obviously because the Dutch and the British were intercepting all this. Uh, correspondence. Um, they could they could uh, wait there and harbor there until they heard word from the Duke of Parma, and that would be a nice place to wait until they. But the, but so Drake knew knew this. Effingham was more of a political appointee. He wasn't. He didn't have the killer instinct that Drake did. And so what Drake did was he around around the Isle of Wight. There are these dangerous shoals that if you crash into, your ships will be destroyed. And so what he did is he attacked the Spanish, forcing them towards either to either crash into the shoals or to sail beyond the Isle of Wight. And due to his quick, aggressive thinking, he was able to force the Spanish fleet away from the Isle of Wight so it could no longer wait there. And then they had to go to Calais. And when they get to Calais, literally, I think the Duke of Parma got word like one day before that this was going to happen. So he was not even ready to go. And Drake, again, with another brilliant idea, decides to launch fire ships at the Spanish fleet. The, f the fire ships don't do much damage. They don't really do any damage. But the fleet panics at night, and they cut their uh, uh, 
anchors and their, their organization, which had largely been intact. They maybe lost maybe three or four ships Can in I the entire interject? campaign. Yeah. Can I quickly interject? Yeah, the reason why they panicked in Calais was because they thought they were Hellburners. Now, Hellburners are basically the 16th century equivalent of a suicide bomber. So it's basically a ship filled with gunpowder, as much as you possibly can, and set on fire and sent in. So they panicked the moment they saw that because they were thinking they were basically going to get suicide bombed. That's why they did it, even though the fire ships don't really do anything. It was like yeah. a... It was like a sort of a faint almost, in a way. It yeah, yeah. Changed. And so the next day, um, off the coast at the Battle of Gravelines, uh, Drake then attacks the vanguard, well, actually the rear guard of the Spanish fleet. Now, at this point, it's disorganized, and their, their unit cohesion is broken. So now they get into point-blank range, and they're not as afraid of being boarded anymore because the Spanish Navy is a shambles. And at point blank range at Gravelines, they they decimate the Spanish. I, I think they lose a third of their ships. A third, they lose a lot. Yeah, like a third of their ships, and they just get smashed. And at that point, they can't go back through the channel, and they can't land um, in Flanders. And to the north is Denmark and Norway, which is of course uh, Protestant. And so they sail around Scotland and then through around Ireland back into Spain. Don't they keep getting sunk? Or aren't they still chased by the English fleet? They are up to a point, but when they get, I think, beyond the Firth of Forth, they just let them go. Mm. And at this point, storms and bad weather and uh, scurvy and other things take their toll. Any any Spaniard unlucky enough to crash on English soil would be killed summarily. Some of them made it to Ireland, and that was a little bit better. Mm. By the time they get back to Spain, there's a third of the fleet left. Yeah, essentially, and, isn't it, so you can almost compare it to Napoleon's invasion of Russia with how they came back. Yeah, but basically, what, 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 what the problem was, the Spanish tactics were totally lopsided. Boarding and, and small bore uh, guns were great for Mediterranean galley fighting. Against like, yeah, against like, against error dows or whatever. Yeah, when you're shooting other sailors and marines, but when you're doing ship-to-ship -ship engagements, the English model of heavy guns... Um, and fast-moving ships was by far the better uh, system. The, but in, but in, it w the fire ship attack was crucial, though, because that's what broke up the order of battle of the Spanish, which allowed them at grave lines to go point blank and just uh, annihilate them. And, and not only that, the, Span the English seamen were far superior. They were much more maneuverable. Uh, the weren't Spanish... A them, weren't a lot of them Dutch hires? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it wouldn't be surprising. The Dutch were good sailors, too. But um, in fact, I think uh, leading up to the Spanish invasion through the channel, the fleet, there was actually the um, signal towers where they would, you know, oh, we see the fleet, and they'd send it off to the next tower, to the next tower. The one, the one huge mistake was that the Spanish made at the beginning of the operation was the English fleet was actually in harbor when they are first moving into the channel. And I think that's when Drake is playing... Um, what is that? The bowling pins game. And he says, you know, we can wait to fight the Spanish in no hurry. Which is <laughs> yeah. Uncharacteristic. Uh, I remember hearing about that. Isn't that like one of those, isn't that just like an amazing sort of um, image of just, he's, or is, is he bowling or playing golf? I think it was the bowling pins. But if the Spanish fleet had attacked the English fleet in port there, they might have been able to gain a decisive We'd all victory. be speaking Spanish then. Uh, Muy bien. Well, well, and then we had the Catholics uh, taking over Western Europe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Northern Europe, Northern Europe. No, I think Sweden. Well, no one would invade Sweden. What have they got pickled herring? P oh, you saw that video. <laughs> <laughs> the history of the world, isn't it? Yeah, the the, the Treaty of Westphalia with um yeah with uh, Hugh Laurie mm -hmm. and Stephen Fry. But anyways, um, so there we go. So the Spanish Armada is defeated. Hopes of a of a re-Catholicized England seem uh, England back under. Political Catholic control seemed to be. Uh... Oh, I wouldn't say that. There was four armadas. One was... actually landed. Oh, look. <laughs> yeah, one landed in Ireland. And oh, no, Ireland. one thing. One thing that I in forgot Ireland. is the year before, um, Drake had sacked Cadiz, and um, oh yeah, that, that, to to singe the beard of the, of Philip. Yeah, but what most people don't know is after the Spanish Armada, Elizabeth commissioned Drake to attack the Spanish, and that was a complete disaster. Yeah, Drake um, Drake grabbed um, Philip II by the pussy that time. Here's, here's the problem. Drake did very well without a lot of oversight when he was more of a pirate. But 
um, the, the, the rules of engagement that Elizabeth gave were very constraining. And so Drake chafed at it and it just didn't work well when he had to play, you know, as a respectable admiral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course he, the funny thing is when he, he died in Panama trying to attack the Spanish and those towns that he'd attacked say 30 years earlier were fortified in the 1590s because of his earlier attacks. So they were actually harder to break through because of his earlier successes. Mm -hmm. So anything else on the Spanish Ramada or the Anglo-Spanish? Well, the, the war sort of ended when around the time when both Philip and Elizabeth died. And Well, Philip died in 1598. And, yeah. Elizabeth, and Elizabeth died in 1603, of course, and it was eventually... It was never actually formally declared, though. So yeah. there, was, there was a Treaty of London in, th in 1604, but, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anything else? Because uh, I think on the last note we can talk about Shakespeare, but before we get to that, anything... What else should we talk about with uh, Elizabeth's reign? Um, maybe Devereux? Devereux? Okay. Yeah, so the Earl of Essex... Um, oh, she, oh I, 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 an interesting note is um, she was courted by the she she was asked, she was proposed to by the Tsar of Russia by Ivan the Terrible. She was that also proposed been, to by the Swedish king. Yeah, wouldn't that case. wouldn't that have been something? Ivan the Terrible as king of England. That'd have been that'd have been now, so, 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 that yeah, would have been so, terrible. Well, imagine, uh, no, imagine, imagine this. Imagine hardy har har. But imagine this. So, okay, England. Uh, you know, uh, their government keeps has been uh, you know years and years and years of fighting between Catholics and Protestants. Who do they get to lead them in Orthodox? The no, a Muslim A Muslim man. She marries a she marries a Moroccan prince. <laughs> <laughs> we we was Anglo's and shit. <laughs> we. <laughs> We, we was Iber we was Iberian Celts and shit. <laughs> Allahu Akbar now. <laughs> the Muslims have come to England. <laughs> this is what happens when you let White Moon run their country. They let the Muslims in. God, shut up. Well, speaking speaking about marrying a Moroccan and the Merchant of Venice, yeah, uh, yeah. Portia almost marries a Moroccan. Yeah, and he, and she's like, but you're a Muslim man. Well, and, that's and not goes, why she, she didn't marry him. She married. She didn't marry him because he failed the test. Oh, because he didn't know what was in a box. Yep. Oh, so I guess speaking on that, uh, Elizabeth's dead, and she just because she's had her uh, reputation as the Virgin Queen, bearing uh, as accurate as inaccurate as that may be, according to certain evidence, uh, she did not have any children. Who's and uh, Mary Queen of Scots is dead after her plot to overthrow. To, to kill Elizabeth, or and uh, who's left? Uh, this little this snot-nosed kid named James the Sixth of Scotland. He wasn't really a kid, though, to be honest. <laughs> he was a oh, bit fine. Older. Well, yeah, not only that, when his mother was when his mother was killed by Elizabeth, he he wasn't terribly um, unhappy because he meant that he'd be next to the throne of both England and Scotland. Yep, and that's and finally, I guess, uh, yeah, you have the. Scottish king, for next time we'll have the Scottish kings of England. But before we go, uh, yeah, I imagine you'd really want to talk about because this because if we're going to talk about culture as well, uh, we can talk about the greatest playwright of England, Sir William Shakespeare, or maybe the world. But <laughs> well, Leo, um, maybe Leo Tolstoy could give him the right. Well, well he, yeah, but Tolstoy. he's more of a novelist, which is not the same thing as a playwright. J no, J.K. Rowling is best. <laughs> Oh, oh no. fuck off! I I'm really kidding. hate those books. No, no, no. Okay, I think I think to find this into culture and politics. Yeah, let's talk now, about Richard let's talk the about Third. That. Richard the Third was uh, defamed by Henry the Seventh. Well, see, Sha Shakespeare's Henriad, where he writes the history of England from Richard the Second to Richard the Third. He he's a part of this uh, sort of Tudor uh, propaganda machine that Elizabeth set up, which is why his play Henry VIII is such a glowing, because it's about the birth of Elizabeth. It's pretty much, you know, uh, to put it today, ass kissing, but uh, he, uh, he, his Richard III, which is a brilliant uh, a tra uh, historical anti-hero villain, is, is a part of that general trend to blacken the name of Richard III. Um, it seems like the Tudors weren't very happy with usurping crown from Richard, and they had to continually justify to themselves that it was the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, mm. yeah, that, and not only that, I mean Shakespeare didn't he invent like a thousand new words yeah. just for like a, he was, one of them. One of them being base. Machiavellian. 
I mean, I, I I haven't read all of his plays. I should get. I want to get around to doing the histories, but I've read. What have I? I've read Winter's Tale. Um, the I keep forgetting the one. Uh, the one that takes place in Vienna where nobody can have sex anymore. Um, that's Twelfth Night, or is that that's in Croatia though? I think. No, no, it's it's what's what's the one in Vienna where it's um. Ah, whatever. Uh, I'll come up with it eventually. But you know. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, of course, Merchant of Venice, which is probably one of my favorite ones. Um, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and I think that's about it. Yeah, well, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I did like the one. I did like it. Well, when measure just, for measure. Measure that's for measure, did. thanks. Well, I do like Winter's Tale because just because of the fact that a character gets mauled by a bit, gets raped by a bear in the book. In the in the play at one point. Um, what have you what have you read, uh, Mauritian? Which one of Shakespeare's have you got into? We read them in school, so I didn't really like them that much. We, I've read Twelfth Night, um, Macbeth. Oh and, yeah, I've also read Macbeth and um, yeah, the other the other one, Hamlet, and Ro Romeo and Juliet. And the only one I really liked was um, Macbeth. So. So no Julius Caesar. I, I guess I guess I'm gonna have to disown you two no, guys. No, Julio Cesare. I acted actually in six and when I was eleven in sixth grade, uh, we we put on the play of Julius Caesar because there we had a whole thing uh, in my school like this whole tradition called the Roman feast, where like you know it, for all the history classes would sort of like you know we'd get we'd like wear togas and like have like this whole sort of eating a lot of sort of uh, foods made to look like stuff they would have eaten in ancient Rome and stuff like that and. Um, like, you know, when we really got into it, and part of it was we put on the play of Julius Caesar, and I got to be one of the guys that uh, that stabbed Caesar. I think I was Brutus, or I was one of the guys who killed C who stabbed Caesar. Hey, too, yeah, Brutus? Th I, I, think, I think Julius Caesar is certainly my favorite tragedy. Um, it's just so perfectly done. I mean, um, there's really no waste. Well, there's very few wasted moments in any of Shakespeare's plays, but especially in Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But remember, the best speech of all time is in Henry V. Oh, of course, St. Crispin's Day. St. Crispin's Day for so, God, so, so Fritz, St. Fritz, George uh, in England. Gonna, you can do it from memory now for us? No, I'm not going to do it. Uh, well, I, can, I, I should... How about, why don't you do it so we can... Because we, we're, we're out of time. So you want me to... Well, I can't do it from memory. <laughs> well, look it up and you read it. Okay, I'll read it. Yeah, or actually, should we get should we get an English, should we get the guy with the British accent yes. to read it? Yes, actually, he should. Okay. Just look up the Saint Crispin's Day speech and and read oh, it wow. and read it aloud to to um to you know take us out. Okay, dokes, if you share your screen, I can read it then. <sighs> well, I'll just send you. Hold on. Uh, read okay. it there. All right, I'll I'll read it out. And do it with emotion. Okay. Do it like Kenneth Branagh. Okay, I'll do it. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a, st for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed like the hounds, should famine, sword and fire, crouch for employment, but pardon, and gentles all. The flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vast fields of France? Or may we cram within this wood, wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million. And let us, ciphers, to this great accompt on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high upreared and abusing fronts, the pernicious narrow ocean parts asunder, pierce out our imperfections with your thoughts, into a thousand parts divide on man, and make imaginary punisance whatever that is, think, uh, think when we talk of horses that you will see them printing their proud hoofs. I will either receiving earth, for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times 
turning the accomplishment of many years into an hour glass. For which supply, admit me, chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. That was it, I think. That was really shit. <laughs> Actually, I think you read the wrong one. I think uh, Fritz wanted the Band of Brothers speech. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. That was that was a beautiful speech, but it was the wrong one. I'll read. I'll read the. I'll oh, read the same. <laughs> shut up! Just shut up, Mersh. <laughs> all right. Uh, you could have told now, me. I was like, sorry what? for poo balling you all, but here's the here's the actual <laughs> one. Shut up. I'll mute. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, now we had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What is he that wishes so, my cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin, if we are marked to die, we now and now to do our country loss, and if to live, the fewer men, the great share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, but nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desires, but if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith my cause, wished not a man from England God's peace. I would not lose so great an honor as one man methinks would share from me for, best, for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more, rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my aunt, through my host, that which he hath no stomach to this fight. Let him depart; his passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy shall put into his purse. We shall not, we would not die in that man's company that fears him. His fellowship die with us. This day is called the feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes home safe will stand on a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him the name of Crispin. He that shall live this day to see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say tomorrow is, is St. Crispian. Then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day, old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth and, and household's words, Harry King, Bedford, Nexeter, Warwick, and Talbot, Salisbury, and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good men teach his son, and Crispian's Crispian shall ne'er go by, but from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he who today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, but he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse they were not here, and they hold their manhoods cheap whilst and he speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. Very good. So, yeah, thank you, you everyone. Right. We'll see you next time. Actually, before we end. Stewards. Um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna, I might do a shit posting stream in like 15 minutes on my channel, so go and have a look at that. I'm just gonna grab dinner, and then everyone who's in the chat is free to come. So. Okay. Alright, thanks you everyone for watching. We'll try this again next time. Right. I'm gonna read the right lines this next time, alright?